Amen. Thank you. Amen. All right. It is good to be here this morning. I, I got something I want to say. Are you ready? Are you sure? All right. Uh, we're going to continue on in this idea of the presence of God bringing about transformation in our lives. And so today I, I, I've titled my thoughts, Walking with God's Presence, Walking in God's Presence. Uh, two verses of scripture I want to read. I'm kind of going old school. You know, the old time preachers, they'd read an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage. That's what I want to do today. So I want to read 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 2 through 6, and uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 7. And uh, so this morning as we begin, what I want to begin with saying is, you know what the church needs is not just people. We don't just need people to attend church. We need saints in the church. Let me say that again. I said the church needs saints in the church. Amen. See, Jesus didn't die on the cross just to make us church attenders. Jesus died on the cross that we might become the saints of God, the people of God in this world. Amen. That declare the glory of God in everything we do. Amen. Amen. I'm ready to go. So just, if, and if I have to preach to myself today, I will. Amen. I'll preach myself happy this morning if I have to. Amen. Amen. Saints who want to walk with God everywhere they go. Saints who want, not just want to come to church and get a touch of God, but saints who want to leave the church with the presence of God inside of them because when we leave the church, we're going to face things and we're going to go through things that it's going to take the presence of God to help us get through. Amen. So let's read 2 Samuel chapter 6. Read it real nice and loud with me. Our custom is to read the Bible out loud. And, and if you don't want to do that, that's okay. You don't have to, but uh, let's just join together. Here we go, 2 Samuel 6. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. <clears throat> so they set the ark of God in a new cart, and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Yuza and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacom's threshing floor, Yuza put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. It goes on to say that Yuza was struck dead when he did that. And we'll get back to that in a few minutes. But let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Let's read it. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Everybody say weight of glory. The weight of God's glory. In other words, our light afflictions that we are encountering far outweighs the weight of God's glory than those light afflictions. And so today I want to talk to you about walking in God's presence. We talk about the presence of God, but we are to walk with the presence of God with us everywhere we go. Not just when we come to church, but everywhere we go, because out there in the world, there's a lot of things that we're going to face that will only be overcome by the presence of God with us. Amen. And so let us pray this morning. Let's pray this prayer out loud. If you would with me, let's pray this prayer. Our Father, 
We thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light for our path. Prepare our hearts to receive your word that it might accomplish all that you sent it to accomplish in our life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You see, saints are the people who walk with God everywhere they go. They depend on Him in every situation of life. They are the true church. The true church is not people who just come and attend. The true church are the people who walk with the presence of God with them everywhere they go. The church is not just attend, uh, attenders, but unlikely people who demonstrate what it is to be a worshiper of God. Let me say this morning, as, as we think about what it means to be a Christian, but Jesus didn't come just to save us. He came to live inside of us so that we could demonstrate his life to the world around us. He came to give us the power to overcome everything that we face in life and overcome it victoriously in his name. It, see, the church is people who come and experience God's presence around them in a church service and leave with God's presence inside of them. That's important because when you live your life, you're going to encounter problems, disappointments, Pain and sorrow. So this morning when we talk about uh, the presence of God. God wants to go with us. Let me say this this morning. True praise unto the Lord. True worship to God. Now come with me today. You're going to have to come up where I am. Because I'm not coming down where you are. You know, Jesus, a lot of times he went down to where people were and he talked in. But there were times he taught. He said, listen, I'm not coming down to where you are. You got to come up to where I am today spiritually. OK, not that I, you know, I'm just saying. And so true worship and true praise of God is a mixture. Of praise and pain. It's a mixture of worship unto God and the and dealing with the pain and the disappointment that you face in your own life personally and all of us e experience that you see praise without pain is just religious rhetoric it's just talk it's just happy talk and some churches that's what they do they they give you happy talk they pat you on the head say you you know you're loved by God God created you God blessed you and and you know and and then the pastor gives you some kind of motivational speech and sends you home that's the way they do a lot of times okay and and that's okay if that's what a pastor wants to do that's okay with me I'm not fussing at anybody I don't hate nobody I ain't mad at nobody but I realize that if the true worship of God, the true praise of God comes with pain through the pain. When you come to church and you're going through trials and you're going through difficulty, but you can raise your hands and say, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing, but I praise you anyway. Amen. And the reason for that is pain will do something for you that will take you to a new place in your faith in God. See, trouble strengthens you. It fortifies you. It establishes you in your faith in God. See, it lets us know that we're not in charge. That God is in charge of our life. There are those times in life when we're going along and we think we got it all figured out and it's going our way. And, and you know, we've got it all lined up and trouble hits. And it's in those times that you have to be able to say to yourself, I don't understand this, but I believe God is with me. Were you ever on the computer and, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're searching the web and, you know, I'm on the web, I'm on pages, I'm on three or four different things at the same time. You know, you minimize them. You know how you do that? 
But then all of a sudden you're going along and then all of a sudden your computer stops and this little round circle goes like that. It's buffering. Do you ever have your computer buffer? I hate it when my computer buffers. I, I'm trying to do something. I, I'm trying to get something accomplished, you know. I, I'm, I'm trying to hurry up. And, and you know what's weird about it? We've come to the place when it buffers two or three seconds, we're about half mad over it. I mean, here we got the knowledge of the world at our fingertips, and we're upset that we have to wait three or four seconds for a computer to buffer. I, aren't we? We're strange, aren't we? Look at your neighbor. Say, we're strange, aren't we? We really are. We have no patience, you know. We got the world at our fingertips and we're upset. We got to wait for buffering. The problem is we do the same thing with God sometimes. God takes us to these points in our life where he's buffering us. Sometimes it says you're being rerouted. You ever see that? You're rerouted. You know, your GPS system in your car, it'll reroute you sometimes. God has to take us through a rerouting at times in our life to help us get to the place he wants us to go. Amen. We go through buffering times as Christians when we're being reset in the way of seeing things the way God wants us to see them. And what I mean by that, when we talk about saints in the church, you know, it's one thing to come to church and say and sing a worship song. Hallelujah. It's another church, that thing to come to church when you're burdened down. And when you don't know what to do, and you say, hallelujah, glory. God, I don't know why I'm going through this, but I'll praise you anyway. I'll give you glory. I'll give you honor. In other words, the weight of God's glory outweighs the problem that I'm going through. People come to church and don't know, you know, anything about God or anything about the church. And they see people worshiping them. They see people going through conflict and trial and difficulty. And they raise their hands and they worship God. And they know there's something different about these people. Morgan Freeman did this series called Finding God. I've been watching a little bit over the internet. And he went to an old-fashioned Pentecostal church where they spoke in tongues. And Morgan said, I don't really understand this, but I know they got something that I don't have. That's what he said. They, they, and then people come to church and, and they experience God's presence even in the lives of others. And they say, I don't understand it, but I need it. I want it. I can't figure it out. I can't explain it. But I need what they have. There's something different in God's presence that I need. Amen. That's why Paul said in saying, yeah, let's give the Lord a hand. That's good. Amen. That's why Paul said, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16, it said, we don't lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing and our inward man is being renewed day by day. Our inward man is being stronger. Our inner, our inner man is, is being glorified. He said, for our light affliction, notice that. Which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding eternal Weight of glory. In other words, the weight of God's glory wants to be demonstrated in the life of the church. Amen. Now, let me show you something else Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He said, for I consider. In other words, in the King James Version, it says, I reckon. In Kentucky, you say, in Kentucky, we used to say, I reckon so. I reckon he did. Reckon just means to, to, to evaluate. It's an it's a accounting term. So that you make the books work out. And Paul said it this way. I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
In other words, we in the church, Paul had come to a place to where he understood. He said, listen, I've weighed out my pain. I've weighed out my sorrow. I've weighed out my tribulations against the glory of God in my life. And he said, I realize that the weight of God's glory far out seeds, exceeds my light affliction that I'm going through here in this life. He said, the weight of God's glory is a greater thing to me than the afflictions I go through. Now, let me tell you something this morning. I'm a pastor. I'm preaching to you today. I'm not here patting you on the head. I'm preaching to you, okay? Look at your neighbor and say, he's preaching to you today. Amen. See, every Christian must come to learn what Paul said in Romans 8, 28. Because he said it this way. For all things work together for good to them who are called according to his purpose. Let me say that again. For all things. Now, this is for every Christian that needs to understand this. For all things work together for good. To them who are called according to his purpose. See if you're a Christian. You need to know Romans 8.28. You need to put it on your refrigerator. If you don't know it. Type it out. and Put it on your refrigerator. Put it in your car. While you're driving down the road. When somebody cuts you off. You say okay. I know that that happened for my good. And God's glory. Right. So I'm not going to react in the wrong way. Amen. See, if you don't know all things work together for good, you're going to get mad at God at some point and give up on your faith. I've seen it happen so many times over the course of my life. I've seen people who go along and everything is fine and everything is good. But then a tragedy strikes, a disappointment happens, a problem takes place. And they say, God, why did you let this happen to me? God, I don't understand. God, I, if, if you're so good, then why would you allow this to happen to me? And I just can't take it anymore. See, there we need to learn Romans 8, 28. Do I have anybody here this morning that has learned all things? Have worked together for good. Not just some things, but all things have worked together for my good. Do I have anybody here look as you look back over your life? And you say, Lord, I didn't understand it then. I, it broke my heart. I, I was upset. I, I was aggravated. I was mad when it happened. I was broken when it happened. But now I realize why it happened. It taught me a lesson. It showed me something about who you are, Lord, that I would not have known had I not been through that problem. And now, well, after that, you can say, thank you, Jesus, that they left me. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. I cried for a week. But thank you, Lord, I'm free from them. Thank you, Lord. You've got another plan for my life. Romans 8, 28. Let's say it together. Every Christian needs to know this. Let's say it together. Do you remember it? For all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. If you're just learning it, let, let, let us help you. For all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. You see, I'm, at, I'm glad I'm in a church that understands that. I'm glad I'm a part of a church that doesn't expect me just to just happy talk all the time. And see, I, I, I'm glad I'm part of a church that says... That praise, true praise, has to be mixed with the pain of our life. Amen. You know, I was reading the other day. I had never seen this before, but there's a new uh, idea in the church. There's some, some churches that are starting to embrace it. It's called progressive theology. And what they're saying now, and, and some of these are prominent people, you know, in the church world. 
They're saying, listen, we need a progressive theology that keeps up with the times. How can we take a 2,000-year-old book and say it should rule in our life today? That's the idea. I, to, to be quite honest with you, I, I, I searched, I really tried to figure out what they do believe. They say they believe in God. What about when it becomes totally unpopular to believe God? Will they believe in something else? I, I, I really have a, a struggle with understanding what they're trying to say here. But they call it a, a progressive theology. And, and But see, I'm thankful that we have been given the Bible. And it helps us to understand the saints of old. Those who have gone through the trials and the tribulations of their faith. And who have come out on the other side victorious. That, that, that is what we read to give us strength. To give us hope. To give us faith. To help us believe. Amen. And so we see that King David. In 2 Samuel chapter 6. Uh, he had been chosen by God. To be the leader of Israel. The king of Israel. And um, he was going to lead differently. Than his predecessor Saul. The only thing he did was. He, he kind of went through the show. Of a, a faith in God. Like so many politicians do you know. And, and he, he had the, the priest kind of with him. At his inauguration and all those kinds of things. But at the end of the day. Paul did it his own way. And David watched it. From a close up perspective. And he saw that. It didn't went, end well for Saul. And he was taken from the throne of Israel. And uh, David was chosen to become the leader. And uh, he said, I'm not going to lead like Saul did on my own. Just from my own ingenuity and my own, you know, talents and gifts. He said, I got to have the presence of God with me. I got to have God help me. You know, it's good to be chosen, right? It's a good thing to be chosen by God. That's, a, that's good. We, we, you know, God has chosen us to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. It's good to be chosen. We, we like to be chosen. But you see, God... Not only wants to choose us, he wants to lead us. God not only wants to save us, he wants to be the Lord of our life. In other words, he wants us to represent him in all that we do, everywhere we go. And so he has chosen us. And a lot of people like the idea that they're chosen. They, they enjoy that idea. It, it helps us. It blesses us. But when it comes to being led by the presence of God, they say, I can do this on my own. The problem with that is you're going to fail. Listen, I am a personal witness. It don't work. I've tried it and it don't work. Look at your neighbor. Say it don't work. It don't work. And so David said, I'm not going to lead Without the presence of God. He knew it was too big of a task for him. On his own. And so David. The only thing he knew to do. There was a, a Ark of the Covenant. Where the presence of God was. It was, a, it was a big box. And had two angels on top of it. And inside of it was. David's rod. And, and some bread. And, some, and, and another couple things. And so. David said, we're going to bring back the ark of God to Israel. And so he, he knew that the ark would help him. He knew that he could pray and God would lead him and direct him. It's interesting to me. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Abraham Lincoln. I like to read a, a, about Abraham Lincoln and his presidency. And it, and it was interesting because it said Lincoln was was raised in a Christian home. As a matter of fact, he learned to read by the light of a lamp, reading the Bible with his mother and dad. But when he became a teenager, he, he kind of questioned his faith and, 
he, he kind of became an agnostic in a way. Uh, and, and then he ran for office and became the president of the United States. The, the thing, though, was when he became president, there was a little problem going on in America called the Civil War. Families were divided. The nation was about to separate. There were seven states that were trying to leave the Union. And when he got in office, he realized that this task was too big for him. And so he turned to the Bible and started reading from wis the wisdom of God's word. And he would pray every day. And, and he kept a journal of the prayers he prayed every day in office. And he realized that this task was greater than he could accomplish on his own. He didn't know how to lead the country out of the vicious and terrible slavery to set people free, that all people could become free in America. He, he read the part that said, love your enemies. And Lincoln is known, he's the one who said, I keep my friends close, but I keep my enemies closer. And that's what he did. He kept his enemies close to him. And his presidency is known as bringing people who disagreed with him close so that he could talk to them and understand their viewpoint and he could love them and honor them anyway. You see, that's what happened to David. He knew he needed God's help to guide him in the right way. And so he put the Ark of the Covenant, if you read it there in 2 Samuel uh, verses 5, 6, and 7, you'll see that he put this Ark of the Covenant. It was outside of Israel, and he wanted to bring it back to Israel. And so he put it on a cart. And he got Abinadab and his sons to help him. And, and he was rolling this cart back to Israel. And, um, but the problem was he encountered a situation. What happened was the cart hit a pothole, and... The ark that was sitting on this cart kind of turned sideways. And Yuza, one of the men that were helping him, he put his hand against the, the ark of the covenant that it wouldn't fall off on the ground. And when Yuza did that, he was struck dead by God. And so David didn't really understand why God would do that. And I think if you look at it just from the outside, you think, God, why would you do something like that? These guys were doing something good. They were trying to do something good. They were trying to bring the presence of God back into Israel. And David got mad about it. And so he said, listen, just leave that thing over there at Obed-Edom's house. Mad at God. And he said, listen. Just leave it over there at Obed-Edom's house. He was mad. And, and so for several months it was over there at Obed-Edom's house. You have to understand who Obed-Edom is. He was an Edomite. The Edomites were not the people of God. They were pagans. They were bad folks. They didn't even believe. They believed in all kind of gods, all kind of weird gods. And he said, David said, just leave it over there. And when David got over his mad spell, you know what a mad spell is? You ever had a mad spell? You know? Down in Kentucky, they say, oh, he's having a mad spell. You know? And when David got over the mad spell, he decided to go over there and look at Obed-Edom's house. And when he looked, he saw Obed. His house was blessed. They were prosperous. Obed was just happy. He was dancing. They were partying in Obed's house. They were having a good time. And David said, God's presence has blessed them. And it will bless us too. He said, I got to get that ark back to Israel. Because he realized that the presence of God brings the blessings of God into your life. 
That's a great message right there. The presence of God will always bring the blessing of God into your life. Always. And so, David said, all right, we're going to change the way we do this. So, so here's my idea. Walking with God's presence. David learned, first of all, you have to change your plans. You have to change your plans to God's plan. And the reason Yuza was struck dead because the law said that man should not put his hands on the ark. Man should not control the ark. God will control the ark, not man. In other words, God is saying, listen, I don't need you to tell me how to run my business. I'll run it myself. If, that, if, the, if the ark should be on the ground, it should be on the ground. You leave it alone and keep your hands off of it. God doesn't need man's hand on his plan. Do you understand that? God doesn't need man's help. God can do what God wants to do. And David understood that he had to change his plan. So David said, all right, let's go back to the way it was supposed to be. And, and there was rings attached to the ark. And they put poles in it. And they put the poles up on the shoulders of men. And they would carry the ark of God's presence into Israel. And David got over his anger. And he came and he understood that the blessing of God was over there. And it should have been in Israel. In other words, God was buffering David. God was rerouting David. God was changing the way David saw things. Because God wanted to help them understand the weight of God's presence on the shoulders of men. There is a weight to God's presence. It's not just something you, you know, you just get whenever you want. There's a weight to the presence of God on the shoulders of God's people. Amen? Amen. So David had to change his plan. You got to change your plan if you're going to walk in the presence of God. You can't do it your way. You can't say, okay, God, I want you. You know, I, I accept you as my savior, but I'm going to do this the way I want to do it. God said, okay, go ahead and do it, but I'm not going with you. If you want God's presence, you got to change your plan to God's plan because God's plan is better than your plan. Amen. God's plan will keep you out of trouble. God's plan will keep you out of sorrow and, and shame and pain in your life. If you follow God's plan and you can find out what God's plan is by reading his word, he will tell you how you should live. That's good preaching right there. Secondly, they had to change their pace. In other words, when they had the ark on their shoulder, the Bible says they were to take six paces a pace is bigger than a step they were to take six paces and then they were to stop and make a sacrifice and worship to the lord see sometimes we want to live by our pace rather than god's pace how many christians have i've known say well you know i'm just taking baby steps right now and, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm trying to work it out. God might be saying, listen, I'm going over here and you're going to have to take some bigger steps to go where I'm going. You're going if you want to follow me, you got to follow me. I'm not going to stand back there and hold your hand and wait for you because I got something greater in mind for you. And you're going to have to speed up the pace to get to where I want you to go. See, some people, you know, well, I'm just taking, they're just, you know, and, and we make excuses for them. Well, you know, they're just taking baby steps. Maybe God's not calling them to take baby steps. Maybe God's saying, I want to grow you up quick. I got a plan, an anointing, and a blessing for your life. I need you to accomplish. I, I, you need to change the way you see things quickly. See, David was called to lead, but he'd never led God's people before. But he had to lead the way God wanted him to lead. It's interesting. I was talking to my son the other day. We, we do a devotional. He's got a new job. It's one of these job placement, you know, companies where they, they place these executives in these businesses, you know. And, uh, and so he calls me on his way to work and we do a devotional. 
together, we pray, and, and we, we, we read a scripture together. And, and so I said to him the other day, I said, Ross, do you understand what you're doing in this job? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're taking people and putting them into a career where they might make hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and they might affect the change in, in these corporations that they're going to be a part of. And you've never done that yourself. You're just starting a career. I mean, he was a drummer for all those years. What does he know? <laughs> right? I mean, he did what he wanted to do. But I said to him, I said, do you realize you're doing something? You're helping people do something you've, you yourself have never done? He said, well, now that you think about now that I think about it, that's right. You see, when God chooses you, he, he will call you to, to help people do things that you yourself have never done. You know, when I first started pastoring, my kids were little. And now here I am trying to help people, you know, navigate teenagers through the terrible decisions of life they make. I'd never done that before with my own kids. There was one young man who, who was one of the most handsome young men you've ever seen. He, he could be a model. He was so good looking. Going to the university. Had a career in front of him. But he was gambling. And the bookie that he was in debt to of about $50,000 sent out word that he was going to kill him if he didn't pay him. And his parents came to me and said, what should we do about this? I'm like, Tell them to quit gambling, <laughs> you know. But you see, God puts you in position sometimes to help, you, help people that you yourself have never been through that situation, you know. I mean, now we're going to do our best to help, you know, Chris and Kayla go through this engagement and all that stuff. Now, I know all about that. I've done that, you know. I can help with that. I've I got confidence in that. But you see, God puts us in positions that we're to do things that we've never done before. And that's what David did. See, we're called to do it God's way, not our way. To do it God's pace, not our pace. And if God says, let's hurry up, then we've got to hurry up. You know, Paul the Apostle was called to preach the gospel. To the Gentiles throughout the Roman world. <clears throat> and he said I'm going to Rome. God wants me to go to Rome. God's called me to go to Rome. And he said that he was on, ship, on the ship ready to go. And this guy comes up. And he's all tied up with all these chains. And all these uh, bands all over him. He said Paul. God told me to tell you. If you go to Rome. This is what's going to happen to you. In other words, he had a vision from God. He said, Paul, don't go. But you see, Paul understood what God had called him to. And Paul said, I appreciate what you're saying and your concern. I ask you to pray for me, but I'm going to go. Whether they lock me up, no matter what they do to me, I'm going to go. Even if they kill me, I'm going to go because I'm running at God's pace, not my pace. Amen. Paul said, I appreciate it, but I have to go God's way. Even if they kill me, I got to go. You see, there's something inside of us. The Holy Spirit inside of us said, run at God's pace. Do it at God's pace. Don't do it at your own pace. Do it at God's pace. Because God needs some good Christians nowadays to show forth His glory, to be involved in the work of the ministry. We need some help around this church. We need some good, strong Christians to do it. Don't be a baby all your life. Grow up. In Jesus' name. Amen. We'll help you. We'll help you. But grow up. We need some help. Don't keep just stumbling around like a child. Become a Grow up in your faith and do what God calls you to do. We'll, we'll help you find your gifts and your talents. But run at God's pace, not your own. Amen. That's good preaching right there. And then lastly, Chris, you can come up. David understood 
to have God's presence, to walk in God's presence, he had to change his praise. In other words, the Bible says that when God said, I want you to take the ark back to Israel, he said, I want you to take six paces. I want you to stop, I want you to sacrifice, and I want you to praise me. David understood what that meant. I think David looked over there at Obed's house. He was worshiping God, praising God. And he thought to himself, you know what? If a pagan can dance before the Lord, I'll dance before the Lord. And the Bible says that when they brought the ark back into Israel, the Bible said David started to dance. They were playing the instruments. They, they, were, they were glorifying God. They were worshiping God. David got over his anger at God and said, Okay, God, whatever your will is, that's what I'll do. And the Bible says that David danced so much that he danced out of his clothes. And he didn't care what anybody thought about it. His wife even, she said, You know, oh, I saw you out there dancing in front of all them maidens. David said, listen, if I've been vile, I'll be more vile because I'm so thankful for the presence of God in my life. I'll dance, I'll shout, I'll worship, and I don't care what anybody thinks about me. Amen. See, he worshiped God regardless if it was popular or not. He worshiped God whether people approved of him or not. He worshiped God whether people understood him or not because he understood that the presence of God was the most important thing in his own life. You see, worship, when we worship like we do, it's not just traditions here. It's shaking off your old way of thinking. I'm not saying everybody's got to do what I do, I'm not saying everybody's got to run up and down the aisles. I, I don't believe that at all. You should have gone to some of the churches I went to when I was young. They said, if you don't dance, you ain't saved, you know. If you don't dance, God is not with you, you know. That's kind of what they, I don't know if that was really what they intended to say, but that's what I heard. And I thought, you know what, I'm shy, man, I... For me to dance before God? I don't think I can do that. But I've come to understand that raising my hands to the Lord is a sign and says, okay, Lord, I surrender to you. I'll worship you. And I don't care if it embarrasses me, I'll worship you. I'll sing to you. I'll give praise to your name. Because of your presence in my life. And I used to, when I was younger, you know, I thought it was all about the preaching. I thought, you know, I don't care about all that music. I did. I just want to hear the word. You know, that's, that's the attitude I had. But I've come to learn in the word, it says, lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. It says, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Praise the Lord. Dance before Him. Give Him glory in any way that you can do. Praise the Lord. See, He changed, they changed their praise because the presence of God was with them. And so today, as we think about walking in the presence of God, having not only sensed the presence of God while we're here, but walking the presence of God out in our life, God wants to use us to be an instrument of praise and honor and glory to His name. Amen. Stand up with me and we're going to pray and close in prayer. Amen. God, to walk in God's presence, you've got to change your plan. You know, you, you, you've got to change your pace. And you got to change your praise. So this morning as we worship God, I want us to pray and say, okay, Lord, do your greater work in me. 
You got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus came as an incarnation of the presence of God that was in the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus was the presence of God in the original Ark. And Jesus said that we are no longer, you know, just members of a church, but we are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the temple of God in the world. We are the dwelling place of the presence of God in our hearts and in our lives. And so today I want us to pray together and say, Lord, make me what you want me to be. I want to be your church. I want to be a living stone, not just a dead stone, but a living stone for you. Walk in your presence. Listen to me, young people, I'm telling you. It's better to walk in the presence of God, even if you have to change your plan and change your pace and change your praise, than it is to just be a church member and attend on Sundays whenever you feel like it. I'm telling you, there's nothing like Walking with God with you. There's nothing. I'm just telling you. I'm a witness. It's better to have God's presence with you because you're going to face something that you don't know how to deal with. You're going to have a disappointment. You're going to have a problem. You're going to have a test or a trial in your life. But the presence of God will see you through. I'm a witness to that. So today, I want us to pray. So if you're here this morning and you want a greater sense of God's presence in your life, we're, what we're going to do is just raise our hands and say, Lord, fill me, touch me. Hold on a second. While we're praying, though, I want us to pray for a few special people. Yolanda Diaz, she's just had surgery. And she's doing better. She's on the mend, but we want to pray that she's recovering from surgery. Some of you know Carol Reed. You haven't seen her here. She's been up in New York. Carol really needs God to touch her. She's struggling with cancer. Advanced stages of cancer. So pray for Carol Reed that the Lord would touch her and bless her and minister to her. We also want to pray for your grandfather. What's his name? Huh? Okay, we want to pray for him. That the Lord would bless him. He fell and broke his hip. So we want to pray and ask God to bless them. And if you would just continue to pray for my cousin Eddie Webb. He's in a rehab place. A, you know like a physical rehab place. Up in northern Kentucky. He had a stroke. Just pray that the Lord would just touch his body and strengthen him. So this morning as we pray. If you want a deeper sense of God's presence in your own life. Walk in God's presence. I'm telling you. It's fun to walk in the presence of God. It's better. It's not some burden. It's better to walk in God's presence in your life. Why don't you just raise your hand. If you want to come to the front, you can. If you'd like to come and stand down here and just receive a special touch of God's grace, we invite you to do that. Come. If you need prayer for something, you can come and stand right here at the front. We're going to pray for you and ask God to bless you and ask God to touch you in a very special way.